Hey guys, this is going to be the review of the Spyderco Capara, one of the newest Spydercos for the year. Uh, this review will incorporate uh, my experiences with carrying it for the last few weeks, uh, EDC use, as well as testing the steel and uh, commentary on what I don't like and like about the knife. This is a very good one overall, in short, positive review for the Capara. Stick around to see how it cuts and uh, yeah, any little issues that I have with it. Alright, so this is the knife. Uh, this is a very uh, high-end Spyderco. Well, we're getting towards the higher end of Spydercos. It's Taichung Taiwan made, uh, which is their, uh, their factory that is, you know, commonly argued that it does their best fit and finish knives. This is a knife designed by an Australian man called Alistair Phillips, and uh, his design brief on it was that he wanted something that is both EDC and food prep. So that's why some of the choices that have been made on this knife were made. So things that are unusual about it, such as no jimping, such as having a pretty low edge in relation to the rest of the handle, are generally with regard to uh, food and cleanliness and ease of cutting against a surface and whatnot. So that's the basic brief, I guess, that he was going for. Uh, Sal picked it up uh, about 18 months ago, as far as I understand, and it has recently made it into production. It was debuted this year and released in about October, I believe. Um, the materials you're getting are S30V on the blade, uh, ground to three millimeters thick, and then you're getting carbon fiber on the handles with stainless steel liners, which are somewhat skeletonized, bronze phosphor washers on a compression lock system, the compression lock being Spyderco's kind of three-piece lock, the leaf spring, that pillar in the middle, and the blade tang are wedged together by the spring tension of this surface here, making the blade lock in a very authoritative way and also making it so you don't have to use, um, you put your fingers in the blade path when you uh, lock uh, the knife or close the knife back up. So yeah, very, very, um, you yeah, know, pretty popular lock really. Uh, the wire clip is the Spyderco standard wire clip. Uh, Spyderco make a couple of different staple clips. They make the wire like that and then they make the spoon like you see on the Advocate and the Paramilitary. The wire is my preferred Spyderco clip. I like it a lot. Um, some people think that it detracts from the look of the knife. I actually think it's a pretty inoffensive piece of steel um, and I quite like it. So there we go. So the blade length is about three point, actually I'll get the specs out and I'll do this properly, stand by. Righto, so specs wise, the whole thing is 210 millimeters long when it's open, 8.27 inches. The blade length from where it's protruding from the handle to the tip is 3.5 inches long, 91 millimeters. Um, the length of it closed is 119 millimeters, 4.69 inches. The edge length is 3.4 inches. It is a pretty long edge, really, compared to some other smaller EDC knives. Obviously, the weight of this thing is 94 grams, 3.3 ounces. The blade thickness is 3 millimeters, and um, the clip can be moved uh, either side, so it's ambidextrous, but for tip up only, carry. Let's look at it next to some other knives, because I always find that paints the picture for me, seeing it next to some other knives that I know the size of. Starting with, well, you might not all know this one, but this is the Spyderco Advocate. Uh, it's about the same size as the Spyderco Advocate. There we are there. And the blade's a little bit thinner than the Spyderco Advocate, it's just a touch. And then we've got the Paramilitary 2. Uh, you know, the, the perennial favorite. Uh, it's about, again, the same size as a paramilitary two. The blade is just a little bit thicker again. The PM2 is at 3.5 millimeters thick. This one's at three. Um, yeah, just a you know, slight improvement in sliceability perhaps. Although the taller blade of the PM2 generally makes it slice pretty darn okay as well. Uh, let's look at it next to an Ontario Rat number two. It's a more common knife, I guess. Let's look at it uh, pivot to pivot. See a shorter handle and a shorter blade, much more EDC sized knife. Another favorite knife of mine this year, the Mastrop Laconico Keen. Similar size, maybe a little tiny bit smaller than the Capara. And lastly, let's round it up with the Bench, uh, yeah, the Benchmade 940. There we are there. And the Almar Falcon. And these are knives that are kind of like I like knives like this a great deal, and this knife does the Spyderco's best version of what these knives do, I think, in terms of carryability at the very least. The uh, 940 is a bit more of a robust cutter there, but um, nice understated looks, slim in the pocket, uh, and it's definitely what I like in an everyday carry knife.
So in my review, I cut a whole bunch of stuff because I carried this pretty much as my primary knife um, whilst I was sort of weaning myself off of the Keen here, which is another winner too. Excellent knives coming very close together. Jeez, it's been a good time. Um, so I used it for a whole bunch of stuff, both for just practical life stuff and also for the purpose of making sure I did something for a review so I could tell you all about it. Uh, at food, this does excel. The ability to cut very, very close to you know, using the full blade against the surface uh, is... Um, you know, something that's really valuable for, you know, cutting up a sandwich or cutting up an apple or something against the surface, against the cutting board. Uh, excellent for fruit, and that is the intended purpose of the knife, food and such. Um, and again, that's why he's chosen to not put jimping there. I think it was because, you know, your hands are getting dirty, jimping's going to catch stuff. Uh, I guess it's a cleanliness thing, and also the knife doesn't really need a jimping because, well, unless you're going to push it outside of its spec, it is kind of just made to be an everyday carry slicing cutting knife rather than anything that's particularly uh, heavy use or tactical. But at any rate, um, the blade is performing very, very well. It's uh, three millimeters thick, so that's very decent for cutting most things. Um, flat grinds, ex you know, pretty excellent for most jobs, apart from cutting through sticky things that have a lot of surface area themselves. So cheese, you're gonna want something that's maybe hollow grind or, or even um, saber grind like this, because you've got the, um, the steel will push the material apart and it'll keep wedging apart rather than sort of hugging the side of the blade all the way through. But uh, apart from that, flat grinds I really do enjoy. You can see me in a previous video edge testing that factory edge angle and it did very, very well, cutting about 200 times through the rope and um, you know, absolutely uh, highly acceptable result for a factory edge in S30V steel. S30V steel itself, um, it's a mid-range powdered steel. It's still excellent compared to what kind of steels we were playing with 20 years ago. Uh, it is you know, still a perfectly acceptable steel to have on your knife. Uh, some people would argue that it being at about uh, 280 MSRP, uh, $188 retail is what I've seen it for on uh, Knife Center and Blade HQ. I bought this one from Blade HQ. Um, that's some, you know, some people are arguing that price is not quite uh, in line with just having just S30V. I think the full package of this knife being a designer knife that is nice and unique with full carbon fiber handle scales and uh, just an overall success, I think it makes it on point for the value. Perhaps not good value, but definitely not bad value either. That's just my opinion, of course. So yes, the S30V in the blade does perform very well. And of course, I have fine-tuned it, so I'm gonna show you the results of me sharpening it down on a KME, reprofiling it to 17 degrees, uh, then going through from 140 grit to do the reprofiling job, and then honing it with 300, 600, and then 1500 grit. So I decided to go only through to 1500 grit because frankly I've been using the crap out of my films lately and I don't have a great deal of them left and I just kind of wanted to see how to go on a more sort of um, average dude angle, or, uh, sorry, average dude edge, which you know not everyone has access to these super high quality um, uh, films from the KME systems. So then all I did was I put it on a stropping wheel, which you could replicate with a stropping belt and use the Tormek compound, which is 3000 grit. And then I was pretty happy with the paper slicing ability out of it. It was definitely felt superior to the factory edge. So now the knife is sharpened with its uh, 1500 grit diamond edge and then a 3000 uh, grit uh, Tormek paste strop. Let's uh, travel to the place we were known and love to see how it's worked out. The knife lab. A moderate increase to 260 cuts through the rope using my, I guess, ex somewhat experimental edge. Um, no real direct comparisons, I guess, can be made because I haven't used this edge before on other S30Vs, but um, it's uh, interesting to see that, yeah, 
steepening that, steepening that edge out just a little bit generally does increase the edge retention against rope at the very least. That's a pretty repeatable thing in my uh, work in the knife lab. So um, overall I'm really happy with the steel for this, uh, this knife, 260 cuts with a pretty easily done edge. I know it took me shorter time because I have a KME and I'm lucky that I have a KME, but um, 1500 grit's a very available bench stone and um, just a strop compound on even this leather belt. Just a matter of time, you'll be able to get the same result with you know, a little bit of training or with a bit of equipment. Does it strop back though? Same compound as the Tormek. Shirty wipe. Boop. Stropping man saves a lot of uh, resharpening. So there we go. Fun times in the knife lab. Uh, good result. Very happy with the steel. Moving on to the handle, I'm also very happy with the handle. Uh, this is a handle that is probably at my, uh, this I probably have the largest hand that might find this really comfortable. I think if you've got a larger hand than mine, you might find it, oh, I don't know, starting to get a little bit thin around here, but um, for me, absolutely no worries at all. This is very much a true two position knife, so you can hold it back here quite happily, rather than some knives that have the forward finger choil. Um, well, the paramilitary two is one for me. I hold the paramilitary two back here, and I know it's just a matter of millimeters, but I feel like my forefinger is a little too far from where the blade starts. Don't know why, it's just how I feel. So I always invariably end up holding my paramilitary two like this for pretty much all the cuts. Um, whereas this one here, it is very much comfortable back here, and I feel, even though as guess, I said, again, just a matter of millimeters, maybe it's because my thumbs are about the same. Sorry, my index finger's about the same edge angle. I don't know, it just feels more successful just holding it like this for say your cardboard cutting and whatnot. And then of course, choking up uh, for me is a very, very nice position. If you have a larger hand, you can just forego this pretty minimalist hump altogether and just go over there for your, you know, detail work, as we all like to say in the knife review game. So there we go. I'm really, really happy with the handle overall. It has a little bit of 3 d -ness. I think it is just done via reduction from each side, but it does feel a little bit sort of, um, you know, uh, what's the word for it? Um, you know, I guess is the word is three dimensional, but I don't think it actually is. I think they're just chamfered nicely. But I think the finish of them is amazing. I love the matte carbon fiber. Shiny carbon fiber to me, I think it might just be all those sort of cheaper carbon fiber touted knives that are just a sticker over G10. They kind of made it lose its luster for me when it's really flashy and shiny. Uh, and generally it doesn't have a great deal of grip either when it's like that. This is just nice and warm to the touch. It's still smooth, but it's not, um, you know, not slick smooth. It's hard to describe, but it looks nice and it feels nice. And as I said, as long as you're using this knife within the spec, I guess, you're going to have an absolutely fine time with grip and comfort overall. The wire clip carries excellent in pocket, uh, uh, as it usually does. And for me, it feels just fine in my hand. Um, the wire clip's kind of got a little bit of give in it, so it will usually squish around your hand where it needs to be when you're really bearing down the knife. As I said, I've done about, well, about over 400 uh, twisted sissile rope cuts with it at the very least, if you want to look at bulk ergonomic performance, and the knife did great for that. It's one of the more comfortable folding knives to have done that test with, frankly, so pretty happy with that as well. Moving on, I, I do like the implementation of the compression lock. I like that they've chosen it. I'll talk about, a bit more about that later in the in the negatives, the very brief negative part of this review. Um, but yeah, overall as a choice, I'm quite happy with it because uh, yeah, it just keeps the uh, keeps things nice and safe, keeps the blade out of the uh, out of your fingers when you're closing it, and also um, yeah, just nice and fun to deploy and to close. It's a um, it's a it's a pretty good one overall. Another thing I really like is the red backspacer. The custom version of this knife was called the red back, so I guess this is an homage to that. So really happy with uh, that uh, you know, being kept in there, really, really nice. The red back spider is one of our sort of nastier Australian spiders, so cool to see a bit of culture in this one here as well. So very, very cool. We Australians don't have a great deal of fingers in the production knife pie, so good on Alistair for getting his all oh, juicy and dirty. Um, 
Got a lanyard hole. It's got an interesting looking pivot, which mercifully is just openable by a, a number eight Torx, I believe. Um, no issues there at all. Let's see, double check. What have we got here? That's oh, a T5. Um, yeah, openable by a number eight Torx, I do believe. I'll correct that on the screen right now if I'm wrong. So in terms of things I'm not super stoked with on the knife, uh, well, it's all kind of centering around this part here. So interestingly, Compression locks, when they are, you know, on these sort of lower profile knives, they need to be very intelligent with how far, with what they do with the blade and how far the blade sort of comes up towards it. You see in the new Mantra 3, they've had to actually recurve the blade just a little bit. Now, I can't do it myself because I kind of have a big, maybe, I just don't have a great deal of dexterity on my index finger here. But there is, if you had a really small little finger, so even if I push really hard into there, you can see and try and slice my finger on that blade edge. Can't do it. It's not possible for me to do it, but um, a couple of people have contacted me and said, yep, I can actually get mine in there onto the blade, um, you know, if I push it in there. So just something to be aware of. For me, because it didn't affect me at all, I'm not gonna put it as like a deal breaker of any sense, but compression locks, um, you know, the Spyderco Paramilitary 2 has this huge part here sort of stopping the blade. So the blade is actually really, really far from your finger when you compression, uh, when you activate that compression lock. Because they've gone with this kind of very, um, you know, even keel, aspect here trying to keep everything nice and low profile it does make that potentially there but as I said not for me but if you've got a bit of a thinner finger or if you're able to then you might be able to get your finger in there and get cut what does affect me though is that this area here in general does feel a little bit small so say when I pull out my other compression locking folders the paramilitary and the Caribbean the area here is <coughs> crikey when I pull out my paramilitary, my Caribbean, the area is a little bit bigger and broader, so I can really just kind of quite casually just pinch my finger in there and engage that lock. This one here just feels a little bit smaller. Everything's a little bit more tight, so I feel like I'm really using the tip of my index finger to get in there and, and engage that lock. These are problems that people who sit and play with their knives are gonna probably have versus people who are actually just buying this as a user knife, but this is a premium knife and it's gonna be mostly bought by knife guys who are probably just as much into the details of it as they are of how it actually uses. So just something that I was aware of when using it and still am, it isn't as great to just, so say a paramilitary too, you can kind of just hold it by this and swing the knife around a whole bunch just with your pinch grip there, you know, no issues at all. This one, if you start doing that, I feel like I could slip out and drop it. So just a really small thing in the grand scheme of like how the knife actually works for you, but it's just something I thought I'd talk about. And in, a, another point is that this does deploy really excellently, but I've still not been able to get it to the point, being able to get it to the point where it flips open, you know, really nicely without being a bit stiff without me having to loosen the pivot and then therefore make the knife do this, which yeah, all knives do this, like that's, you know, that's a given, but without it doing it um, you know, to the point where it's off-centered or to the point where it's just too much. So I'm just still trying to achieve that balance. So I guess that's the only other thing I'd bring up in terms of that, just the lock area. I'm still glad they've gone for the compression lock and I, d I would take it with this over probably most other locks. Uh, it keeps the knife unique and it keeps it, you know, in, in fun to play with and keeps a very safe lock on it, for sure. You can start, you know, you'll, I'm sure I'll eventually be able to do all the tricks with it, but it's just a little bit tight. Bronze phosphor washers are gonna do that until they break in, perhaps, who knows. That's about the only bit of criticism I have, apart from Tai Chung has very sharp spider holes for the first little while, but you generally find opening and closing them, they kind of wear down just a little tiny bit, so enough that they're no longer uncomfortable. And if you do have an issue with that, just run some silicon carbide paper through it for a couple of seconds and you're good. So that's all the criti critique I really have of this knife. Look, overall, I feel like this knife takes some really great attributes from both the um, Paramilitary 2, being the compression lock and being sort of the, you know, the rough styling of it, I suppose, handle-wise and all that, and the Spidey Chef in terms of having a blade that is quite dynamic to use against multiple things. Um, it's a really nice, slim design. It actually almost feels like it's from the Almar school of knives that look almost inoffensive. They look almost kitchen-esque, and I, I really do appreciate that. And I also, it might even just be the red and the silver, silver and the black also doing it, I'm not sure, but um, definitely has some um, Almar triggers for me as well. 
I really, really like this knife. It's probably my second favorite Spyderco after the Spidey Chef. Um, don't let my disparaging of its lockup mean that I think that I mean that I like it a great deal less than you know anything else going. It's you know just trying to be as honest as I can. Um, the paramilitary 2 for me, it's a good knife, but it does seem to stick around just more as a staple. And the Caribbean is another one of my favorites, but it's just a bit more situation specific. But for pure EDC, these are both wonderful. Um, I probably, what edges this out a little bit more is probably just the appearance and design and also the uh, sort of impervious to nature that this has being LC200M. Uh, I do prefer the steel, which does hold its edge for about as well as S30V in my testing and is also more or less entirely stainless. Um, this is a bit more expensive, I believe, or at least about the same price. So it really is a fair call between the two of them. If you were to get this one over this one or this one over this one, I wouldn't judge you too hard at all. All right, guys, that's my review of the Kapara. Well done, Alistair. You've done awesome, dude. I think Australian knife dudes are super proud of you. And um, overall, I think it's a very well executed piece. See you then. I'll uh, catch you later in the knife lab. Goodbye, guys.